So yeah, welcome. I'm just in the shack listening to some 80 meters DX. Right now I can hear Canada coming in. So one or two stations working. I just thought I'd put a little video together and explain one or two things about amateur radio for some of the newcomers that may not know everything. So sit back, enjoy this one. All will be revealed in Amateur Radio Explained by M0YKS. So I decided to put this presentation together to assist people who might consider getting a ham radio or amateur radio license. So I've called it Amateur Radio Preview. So what is Amateur Radio all about? So Amateur Radio is an international community of people who use radio transmitters and receivers to communicate with others, other radio amateur operators. This may be worldwide or maybe local or perhaps it may be in distant places out in the space. It's not uncommon to speak to people on board the ISS, the space station. So what do we do? What do radio amateurs do? There's lots of cool things that we can do, from working satellites, talking to astronauts. We can use our radio amateur technical expertise and put it into good use for radio control products. Drones, aircraft, all kind of things. There's digital modes for those who like to operate computers. And, and what we call four mode, that's when we pick up a microphone and do a bit of talking. Other modes include slow scan television, where you receive images. There's also fast scan television. There's also uh, amateur television um, transmitting on high frequencies. There's radio telegraphy, that's the, the oldest type of uh, methods still in use. And we've got home brewing, which is very popular, where you build a lot of your own equipment. As well as all this, we have to think about the more serious side of things and we can use radio for public services. I'll talk a little bit about that shortly. Again, we've got vintage radio, which is another interest in the hobby. People collect modern equipment and also old equipment. It's good fun when you can uh, get some old equipment and fix it up and get a good contact on the air. So, a few words at the bottom. QRP, that's low power, HF, high frequency. VHF, very high frequency. You'll hear DX in, that's when you're talking to someone a long way away. We've got MCOM, that's Emergency Communications. There's technical stuff, technical talk, lots of interesting information you'll learn. We've got contesting where you can work others. These are all the things I'm going to be looking at through this presentation. Contesting takes place on a regular basis, on different bands, different objectives, speaking to people all around the world, or local, in different zones, squares, grid squares, all different kind of contests. Sometimes you can contest into different things such as working in, in an uh, event which may involve an uh, old building or a lighthouse or a castle, for example. You can also work as a satellite, which I've mentioned at the beginning. We've got digital communications, which is uh, very popular these days. SSTV, which stands for slow scan television. And again, some more space communication. So all that's coming up in the presentation. So communicating, experimenting, interacting, maybe competing. Amateur radio is regulated, it's a non-commercial radio service. That means you're not supposed to make any profit, any gains, whilst uh, transmitting on the, on the radio frequencies. Unlike other radio services such as CBs and GMRS, hams can transmit with as much as 400 watts PEP. So that's the output power from your antenna. However, that has been uh, discussed recently and that may be getting altered to one kilowatt uh, here in the United Kingdom. Other countries may operate higher power such as up to 1.5 kilowatt in some countries. Experimentation is not only allowed but it's encouraged. Ham radio is truly a hobby but often one that makes a difference especially in emergency or disaster situations. It is an activity of self-learning, intercommunication and technical investigation. So it's good fun to play around and build antennas and, and try all kind of experiments. Different heights, different lengths, all kind of different bands, different times of the day, different conditions, different solar cycles. The list is endless. I want to talk to local friends over radio waves using handheld transceivers. You can communicate digitally using packet modes, using uh, internet connected repeater systems. There's all kind of methods to do all this these days. The digital technology has really come on well. You exchange personal messages or vital information or possibly in an emergency. You may need to communicate some emergency serious responsive messages. 
We may talk to other hams anywhere in the world or engage in contests all over the airwaves. There's something for everyone here. And in the UK, there's over 80,000 licensed radiometers already. And this number is steadily increasing. So, QRP, that's where we start off. That stands for low power. Communicating with very low power, it can be challenging, but many hams enjoy this challenge. Quite often you may hear people active from something known as a SOTA, which stands for Summit on the Air. That's usually someone at an elevated high ground using low power. However, you can work low power contacts quite successfully uh, without being high up, providing you've got a reasonable antenna system. QRP generally stands for transmitting signals under 5 watts. So HF, high frequency. Hams can talk to other hams in literally any part of the world using the short waves. So by bouncing signals off the ionosphere, signals can travel thousands of miles. And it's not uncommon to get what we call ducting or tropospheric conditions which allow the ionospherics to reflect the signal back to Earth and you never know where it's going to end up. So this is how it works, we've got different layers, and we've got different um, ionized layers charged with particles from the sun uh, and that's hitting the ionosphere, compressing it and they start in the shape of the ionosphere and our transmitted waves are hitting it and reflecting back to the ground and uh, depending on the height of the wave that will determine where the reflection comes back to the earth another look at it is from the sun's point of view so the solar discharge of the uh, solar wind or the uh, magnetic fields which are being dispersed by the sun play a large part on what we call uh, DXing or the effect on the solar uh, radio waves it can harm satellites it can uh, knock out electronic equipment if we have a severe solar outburst uh, but uh, from the radio perspective you can see the waves are distorted around the earth and that's the ionosphere all those distorted waves allow uh, radio signals to get trapped and ducted and that's how we get our long distance contacts another look at the layers shows you how we've got different types of layers they've all got their own different names and they're all at different heights and each layer will reflect a signal back to a different uh, angle and give you a different distance. These layers uh, are always active, dependent on the time of year, the time of the cycle, and possibly the, just the time of the day. Also, different bands or frequencies uh, determine how successful you are reflecting your signals off of these various layers. Certain layers work better for different frequencies, like VHF, very high frequencies, often pierce all the layers and penetrate through them, giving you a very good signal into space. Whereas the high frequency layers, uh, the high frequency waves are much larger and they reflect back to Earth. So you, you can generally get further around the globe with the high frequency stuff. So, how do we keep this under control? We have what we call a band plan here in the UK, and so does most of the operators around the world. Band plans are a guide for you to operate between an agreed allocated frequency, which has been agreed by international regulated bodies. These frequencies is where you, as a license holder, can transmit. And it also will give you a guide of the output power your license allows you to transmit. Reception-wise, you're pretty much free to receive anywhere you want. But transmitting-wise, you, you've got to stick between the allocated bands. So starting at the bottom, you've got 160, which is 1.8 megahertz. That's where it starts and ends at 2 megahertz. And you look at the very top, you've got 23 centimeters, which is 1240 megahertz to 13.25 megahertz. The, the main difference is the size of the wavelengths. On 160 meters, you've got a 160 meter wavelength. So antennas are generally constructed into different sizes. You get full wavelength, half wavelength, or quarter wavelength. And if you imagine a 160 meter antenna, it's going to be a big antenna. So it's not uncommon to have people operating on quarter wavelength antennas. However, if you've got the, the uh, land, you may be lucky and you can have a full size, full wave, 1.8 megahertz antenna. So that's a band plan for the United Kingdom, uh, the Europe, Europeans and uh, worldwide other radio amateurs use a similar band plan but there is variations in certain frequencies, depending where you are. 
So, VHF, very high frequency, and ultra high frequency. Hamzy enjoy uh, extremely reliable communications using these bands. You can generally operate very well between the local community. You can get a little bit farther using a simplex um, repeater, which operates uh, with an input signal and an output signal. That ex can extend the range up to 50 miles or more. Basic simplex operation is non-repeater use, where you put a straightforward transmitted signal from your antenna to a received antenna and the other person does the same back to your antenna from their antenna. That's simplex. If you use a repeater, it's, it's engaging in a two-way uh, relay transmitter, which is generally situated in, on high ground and therefore is very good for boosting your signal, particularly good for mobile use. So the two devices you can see there are your typical VHF and UHF radios. To the left you've got the uh, mobile transceiver and to the right you've got the handheld transceiver. So these kind of things are particularly useful when emergencies and things take place. We have different uh, types of emergencies from natural to uh, obviously um, other incidents where we may need to use radio communications. There is a number of voluntary services throughout the world uh, which operate alongside the um, correct people who obviously are responsible for these kind of affairs. So it isn't uncommon to see an emergency uh, volunteer service assisting uh, probably the police or, or, or fire services. For more information look up your local uh, voluntary service. In the UK it's Raynet. So, what's DXing? That's uh, what we do when we want to talk long distance. Uh, we can use uh, simple equipment when the conditions are good and get remarkable results. When the solar cycle is low, we may need a bigger antenna and a little bit more power. But using the uh, HF bands, which is 10 meter band, which is 30 megahertz, down to uh, 160 meters, which we said already is 1.8 megahertz, we can uh, regularly make contacts of long distance. So many DXs like to contact stations on rare islands and countries which aren't frequently present on the airwaves. This is what we call chasing DX. Quite often uh, uh, the, you may get an expedition of uh, amateurs which will go to a rare or exotic location and uh, operate from there and activate that area just so that you can uh, speak to it. These radiometers may be sponsored and uh, it may be a big special event, so it makes a lot of excitement on the band and a lot of activity. That's DXing. Contesting is similar, however it's just for a short session, usually varies. Uh, you get short 2 hour contests, 12 hour contests, 24 hours, and then you sometimes get the full 48 hour contests. The idea is to uh, work as many stations within that time located on certain frequencies, uh, passing information two ways recording it accurately and then submitting a log at the end so, some contests offer uh, trophies some contests just uh, for the fun of the sport and give you a certificate it's all good fun and if you've got a, a, a bit of uh, time on your hand and you want to try and get a few long distance contacts it can be a great way of doing it so you can put your radio skills up against other hams and other teams of hams Another method of communicating is digital. This is getting more and more popular and there's lots of methods which you can use. Uh, you can connect a computer to some software and, and install a interface to your radio and you can transmit digital data over the air and receive it. This can be interesting for transmitting signals long distance because digital can provide a very good uh, received quality transmission and uh, you can make uh, low power contacts very easy. It's also useful for transmitting into space and uh, doing what we call EME moon bounce where we can transmit a signal off the moon and bounce it back and speak and receive it at another location. There's all kind of fun involved in amateur radio and the digital side is getting bigger and bigger. I did mention uh, the repeaters a little bit earlier. This is a little bit of a closer look at what a repeater system is and how it operates. It uses um, a two-way transmitter, generally uh, an input and an output, and, and this usually happens with two bands or two separate split frequencies, depending on what kind of repeater you're activating. Some are connected to multibands, where you have HF and VHF and UHF combined, and then some are connected to the internet as well, which can give you um, 
obviously a lot more um, opportunities to talk to other amateur radios using the technology. So you may have a mixture of someone working through a handheld, connecting to a repeater which is connected to the internet, which is then transferred to a second transmitting repeater in a different country, talking to a person driving a vehicle using their radio back to that repeater and so forth. So it's very interesting. Uh, you can dial up different repeaters using the network with digital um, CTSS tones which uh, operate from your keypad on your small handheld device. Obviously these repeaters can be accessed by base stations. So very good fun and very handy and can be again extremely useful in emergency communications. A simple uh, computer interface to the repeater transmitter and a mast is generally what uh, the system sets up like. Very good for mobile especially in terrain with uh, plenty of hills around which may cause a problem normally on VHF and UHF which operates in a direct straight line generally on FM but we can use SSB and AM but we don't generally do that on the uh, local repeaters it's usually FM. Morse code is another option and is still very popular there's still contests operating on Morse code and there's still a lot of good Morse code uh, signals to be received and uh, a lot of manual operators are still bashing the key so it's great to hear and uh, it's the original mode some call it the digital mode because these days you can uh, use computer interface Morse code transmitters and receivers however there's still a lot of people that do the original technique and you can see various different types of keys on the screen We've got paddles and, and we've got lever keys and, and we've got the straightforward uh, straight key. So uh, many, many people consider this to be the language of ham radio. Though it's not required these days for most licensing in most countries, but it is something that's still very popular. CW stands for continuous wave and will probably uh, always be part of amateur radio from the very beginning to the very end. The method I mentioned earlier for receiving pictures is known as slow scan television or SSTV and sometimes you get lucky and the space station transmits pictures as it's passing by overhead orbit in the earth. Uh, other radio amateurs operate on the HF bands, there is allocated frequencies and you can transmit images and receive images between each other uh, with your call sign attached and it can be good fun. That's slow scan television. Other methods of communication, like I've said, is uh, VHF FM communicating to astronauts uh, on board the International Space Station. So that's quite uh, an exciting uh, objective and I've uh, managed it to do it myself a few times and uh, it's not uncommon to hear these uh, guys operating on the frequency in between their shift pattern when, they're, uh, when they've got a little bit of time on their hand. So uh, it's great fun and very easy to do with simple equipment and low power. So that's got a lot of good fun. Uh, other communications similar to that is talking through the ISS repeater, which is similar to the repeater system I mentioned a few moments ago, but this one's all but in the earth. It's the same technique, but this time we use two different bands. So we have a up, a uplink and a downlink. Uh, for example, a 145 megahertz uplink and a 435 megahertz downlink. Satellites operate in the same manner, but the only difference with satellites is we have a couple more options. There's a lot of uh, SSB satellites, sideband ones, which also operate on split bands, and we have the FM satellites. So satellites are deployed regularly, so it's worth checking what new satellites have been put into space and are orbiting. And you can operate with simple equipment and very low power. It's not uncommon to uh, get into a satellite using less than 5 watts and a small antenna which you can see to the left which is an Arrow Mark II antenna. Really good fun uh, and there's also uh, other methods such as digital communication by the satellites which is good fun too. If you, don't, if you want to keep your antenna on the ground perhaps you're a little bit more active and you like to uh, get out and about. Some clubs offer uh, fox hunting which is uh, where there may be a hidden transmitter and you have to go and find this transmitter using your radio receiver. Uh, track the signal, uh, use an antenna and uh, first person to find it wins the prize, that's good fun. And obviously you can use your skills once you develop them to assist in search and rescue missions should you be a uh, part of the uh, voluntary services. So that's known as amateur radio direction finding and there's uh, information on the net about that. That's another part of the hobby which is good fun and if you're uh, fit and active 
it's a great way to get out and combine fitness and radio at the same time so how do you become a radiometer hopefully you're finding it interesting and you're thinking this sounds good i want to try some of it so what we've got is regulatory agencies that issue amateur radio licenses in the uk we've got ofcom other countries have their own uh, regulating authorities uh, and they basically set the examinations which are then um, um, kind of guided by the Radio Society of Great Britain, the, great, the RSGB, uh, and organised. And you can contact the RSGB online, book an exam, and you can sit your exam these days online from the comfort of your own home. So uh, it's a lot easier than it used to be. It used to be paper-based in a club. These days you can access it directly by just simply uh, either phoning, I believe, or uh, maybe inquiring online and um, making a payment and arranging the date uh, someone will contact you run through everything with you and then you can sit your foundation exam or your intermediate or advanced if you're in the united kingdom i should imagine um, other countries have a similar method these days so for the first initial license it's known as the foundation license you must pass 25 questions of a multiple choice examination the topics that are covered in the exam are radio and electronics fundamentals basics operating station equipment again very basic such as transmitter antenna power supply unit and then you've got to briefly know how to communicate with other amateurs such as signal report phonetic alphabet call signs and then licensing regulations so like we mentioned right at the beginning on the band plans where you can operate where you're allocated to be able to operate and what power output you should be running as a foundation license holder the output power currently is set to 10 watts maximum. There's other things on there which you need to know such as operating regulations and a couple of questions on electrical and RF safety. So 25 questions to get you going if you're considering getting your foundation license. Once you get your license you then can apply for a call sign and it will generally start with M if you're in England, MW for Wales, MM for Scotland or MI for Northern Ireland and basically the number would be number seven currently so it would be if you're in let's say Ireland you'd be MI7 and then you'd have your personal uh, suffix which is usually three digits three uh, letters <coughs> excuse me so that's a little bit about licensing so like I said there's uh, three classes of license here in the UK uh, we have the foundation which is your first amateur radio license which basically is to get you interested in the hobby, get you used to it, get your basic skills in there, how to operate, to learn a little bit about electronics, antennas, amateur radio fundamentals, and put some good practice in. From there, you can progress to the next, which gives you a few more privileges, such as a little bit more power. Uh, and uh, you can, uh, for that, you, you, did, you used to have to construct uh, a project, but I do believe you can do that straight online now. Uh, so it's a little bit more detailed information uh, similar to the foundation but built up on it with a little bit more of a te technical aspect which you need to know for that. And then from there you can move to the advanced license which uh, is basically um, a lot more technical questions and uh, each time you step up there's a lot more questions. So the foundation is 25. Uh, I would imagine, I'm not, I can't quite remember the amount for the intermediate but I know the advances, I think it's about 65. So it moves up each time so you book it through the radio site of great britain and you um, sit the exam like i said online at home uh, there's various websites uh, if you look them up for training purposes and some very good ones here in the united kingdom and uh, you just want to put in some foundation license tr uh, courses training and they'll pop up and you can sign up and there's some great guys which will help you through uh, a lot of information Obviously, I've got a lot of amateur radio videos which I've made, and that'll give you some insight to how to operate. So, once you've got your, your uh, call sign and your license, you can get on the air and start speaking to other operators. So, like I said earlier, if you're operating from the UK and you're in England, you'll be calling stations with the um, prefix M or G. If you're in Scotland, it'll be MM or GM for the older calls and the Isle of Man is MD or GD uh, you've got Guernsey which is MU or GU uh, you will have Jersey which is MJ or GJ 
and MW or GW is Wales. So when I'm mentioning G, that's the older call signs which were issued um, a period of time ago. And once those uh, call signs were used up, they moved to M. And that's what the uh, the current uh, prefix or start of any call sign of a radiometer operating from the United Kingdom uses. When you change, if you go on holiday, you will change your call sign accordingly to start with wherever you've ended up if you're in a different country. For example, I'm in England, so my call sign is M0. And if I operated in Wales, I would change it to MW0. So what do you need to get on the air? Well, all you need is a handheld transceiver. These days you can get very cheap ones on, on the internet for as little as £50 or some, a lot cheaper as well. Uh, obviously, you pay a little bit more, you get a, a better quality transmitter and receiver. Uh, don't suffer any interference and don't give out interference. As a radio amateur, you've got responsibility to pr make sure you don't interfere with any other radio users or services. That is the main um, thing which you've got to consider at all times. And you've also got to be prepared to test your equipment on a regular basis to ensure that you're not causing any problems. And if you do have any problems, you've got to uh, rectify them uh, and write them. So that's the situation there. So, other than that, not meaning to scare you, a couple of simple bits of equipment, a handheld and a portable uh, 10 watt, uh, sorry, 5 watt output radio. That's an FT817 at the bottom. Very nice bits of kit. There is some uh, cheaper ones now made from in China which are quite good. So uh, obviously uh, there's a lot of good equipment out there to, to be had. You can may operate mobile. For some people that's an option which proves to be very successful for long distance contacts and also working uh, local and also operating the repeaters. There's generally um, most bands can be worked from a mobile station. Some stations operate 100 watts, some operate 50 watts, some operate 10 watts. I've even um, spoken to people using amplifiers, putting out 2 or 3 or even 400 watts. So um, depending on what equipment you've got, uh, you can get some serious good range. The advantage of operating mobile is you can get out in the sticks where there's no noise level, no interference, and you can make some serious nice long distance contacts. It's also a fun way of keeping in touch whilst out and about. You can use this, uh, a variety of different antennas, from mono band antennas, which generally work the best, to think something called a multiband antenna, which is usually a combination of um, two or more bands. So there's various uh, setups you can choose, or you can uh, operate from base if you've got the uh, ground area for a decent antenna. Uh, you can get a base station there. Obviously, good for contesting. Uh, you can get um, different kind of equipment, different radios for different frequencies, so you can monitor more than one frequency at one time. So uh, a typical base station for HF will consist of a power supply, a transceiver, an antenna tuner, an amplifier if you're lucky, or if your license uh, allows you to operate one. And if you choose to use digital mode, you may need a PC and an interface. Some, some radio, modern radio uh, will plug directly into a computer. And these days you can have remote controlled amateur radio stations which can be operated via a PC or a laptop or possibly a smartphone uh, from a different location back to your own station remotely. So there's lots of things and good things about a base station and uh, obviously uh, great to have one in every home and good for emergencies. So what do we need if we have a base station? Well we generally need a decent antenna. There's various types of antennas available. If you're lucky, you may have a tower like uh, the chap in Australia has, you can see at the bottom corner, very nice antenna, rotating tower, but not everybody can have that kind of thing, so more likely the bottom left hand is something which most of us can have, a wire dipole. Depending on what frequency and what band you want to operate on would determine how long this dipole would be. There's lots of information available on the internet and there's various formulas which you can use and calculate the precise length of an antenna to make it work efficiently to match the uh, radio output. We have to we talk about standing waves, SWR, uh, we have to make the antenna resonant so it's the correct length so all the energy is absorbed from the transmitter through the feed line to the element and out into the atmosphere. So we have to make sure the wavelength matches the size of the antenna we're transmitting with. 
So you can get different ones. The top one shows a multiband dipole where you've got one or two different wires of different lengths for different bands. The one below that's got a four to one ballon that allows you to operate on different bands. So there's various options there. And again, you can look on the internet and, and explore different th uh, ways of building different wire antennas, including loops, uh, square loops, triangular loops, delta loops, uh, there's all sorts. So some of us are looking to have a Yagi, which is obviously a more sturdy uh, fixed element. And then if you've got more than one element, you get additional uh, output gain and additional receive gain. So that, uh, the more elements, the bigger uh, reception and transmission pattern you will get. And also the directional, so you can focus all the energy in a certain direction. So that's a good thing about a Yagi. That's a portable Yagi and it's used for satellite work. A simple uh, 145 and 435 megahertz dual band antenna mounted to a camera tripod. Two handhelds, one for one frequency on the uplink, we'll say 145 megahertz and one for say down downlink frequency 435 and that will work into the space station into the satellites and uh, pretty cheap and good fun obviously if you're in a good position you'll get out uh, with a larger uh, unobstructed um, direct line of sight to the satellite or space station so if you're fortunate enough to have a bigger st setup for working in the space you can have a computerized controlled station uh, that's a auto control station which tracks and follows a, a satellite or space station using software, a PC, an interface, a transmitter, a rotator and a couple of um, high gain antennas. Other antennas which you'll need operating may be simply something like a vertical. That's a multiband vertical for HF to the left. That operates on various bands, probably six different bands on the HF bands. Uh, any multiband antenna is a compromise compared to a monoband antenna, but still can be very effective and mounted uh, in the right kind of position, the right kind of location can work really well. Some people will use a small mobile antenna. Again, some of these can be uh, compact, some can operate off a magnetic mount, some are permanently fixed. Generally, the permanently fixed ones work a little bit better to get a better ground and um, it works out much better for an output transmitted signal. So, if you've got any resources, maybe you consider looking at these manuals. These are the sort of things I looked at when I was into it. Uh, I've been licensed for uh, 20 years, uh, but I read the books and um, sat the exams, self-studied and got through the advance without um, going to anywhere. I just read up and passed it first time, so it is possible. That was quite a few years ago. It was a paper-based exam when I did it, and I did have to go to a club. It was pretty difficult. I put a lot of effort in. But, you know, the saying, put a bit of effort in and you get what you want. The foundation license is fairly easy. Uh, if you read through the booklet, uh, do a little bit of studying, you'll find it uh, a great starting point. More information available by the radio site of Great Britain. So, hope you've enjoyed the, um, the presentation so far. So there were a lot of information there to take in, obviously. But I thought I'd just put that together and try explain one or two things about amateur radio and the hobby and what you can get out of it. It's a great hobby, uh, you meet a lot of good people, it's good fun and uh, obviously you can get established and get a big station but or you can start off with a small handheld like this and talk to a lot of people. So hope you found it interesting and useful. Thank you very much for watching. My name's Simon, M0YKS and I hope to catch you on the amateur radio bands. Have fun. Good luck.